So um, if you've not been a part of our church um, and you're new around these parts, I do want to just remind you that we have a couple things going on in the life of our church that you will want to hop into. If this is your first time here and maybe by the end of the service you deem your last time here, hey, that's no offense to us, but please take one of these books with you on your way out because the whole idea is to get the word of God into the hearts of the people of God. And uh, what we're doing here around our, around our church, only on this campus, by the way, uh, is we're going through the book of Acts chapter by chapter, week by week. And um, we're stepping into part two of our journey because we started the journey back last summer. Uh, we went through the first half of the book of Acts and, uh, in the summer and the fall, and then we took a break for Advent and Stewardship Series and Lent, Easter, and such. We spent a little time uh, in a series that was called To Know This Love, where we went through, the, through some of the writings of Paul to remind ourselves that ultimately Paul's intent was that we would be reminded that because of Christ, because of the spirit that's been given to us and placed within us, we can be at one with him and union with him and therefore also be representatives of him in a way that he would declare. Like, it's not we who live, but it's Christ who lives within us. This was a teaching of Paul's and you start to notice this in all of his writings, but that's what we spent some time with. And then last week we kicked back into this because we wanted to get the second half of Acts. It's 28 total chapters. And today, we're going to be in chapter 15. And if you would choose to take one of these, they're free, and so we hope that you will take uh, at least one for yourself. Um, what you'll find inside these little books are daily readings. Um, they'll go along with an email subscription that you can also get into for free uh, that a friend of ours, J.D. Walt, leads, where he takes the same portion of the reading that's in your book and he reads it, and then he expounds upon it. And we would invite you and encourage you to, to dial in. It's on the back cover of how to get to that subscription. But we want you to do the readings every day. They're very short. They'll take you like 30 seconds to read. An additional five minutes, 10 minutes to do your own thinking. Maybe an additional 12 to 15 minutes to listen to JD's reading. And most of you have a commute at least that long. And so just want to invite you to, to be daily involved and engaged in this so that when you show up on a Sunday... You don't show up waiting and wondering for what the performer up on stage is going to have to say, but you show up to say, I wonder if the pastor saw things the way I saw things. I wonder if the Spirit spoke to him in a different way than the way the Spirit spoke to me when I was reading this, or, or maybe the same way. Some people show up and they go, I wonder if, if Brent saw what I saw. It's a great way to kind of come curious to worship instead of uh, just merely for the consumptive, whatever he tells us, that must be all there is. Because I'll admit, as always, what I offer to you is just a part of what there is. It's not all of what there is. It's just a portion. And I want to invite and encourage you to, to be digging in for yourselves to see what the Lord has for you. But we're stepping into the flow of the early church. This is what the book of Acts is. It's a chronicle, sort of, of, of how the, the Spirit of God entered into the people of God and then was just set loose in the world. And, and I like the way that Pastor Karen always says it in our missions, that we exist uh, to make Jesus known until the whole world knows. That's been sort of our tagline for our missions ministry. And we think that it's possible for the whole world to know because he's, he, Jesus, has put his spirit into us and they commissioned us to go into all the earth, making him known, preaching and teaching the word of God, bringing people into the, into the fold. In the book of Acts, we had a short little summary last, uh, last week. You can go and look at it. It was an eight-minute video uh, from the people at Bible Project. They summarize things really, really well. And Tim Mackey, who leads that effort, is super intelligent. But you can go back, Google that Bible Project, first half of Acts, and you'll see what we saw last week. But what we were reminded of last week is that Jesus not only promised the Holy Spirit in the first chapter of Acts, but then he fulfilled the coming of the Spirit in the second chapter of Acts on Pentecost Sunday, which was last week. We find in the first few chapters the apostles have received this Spirit, and they began going out into the places where they could gain some influence to bring the good news of God to the world. And they all start bringing this stuff out. And, and in many cases, it's not really received well. But to others who are hearing this word of God in a new way, in a, in a way that's a little bit different than the way they've heard the way of God spoken about before, a way of God that's less about the rules and getting it all right and more about salvation coming as a sheer free gift of God in the work of Jesus, 
Responding to some news where, where they, they hear things a little differently, they say, wait a second, the, the yoke is easy? The faith we've been practicing, the yoke has been hard. They had heard Jesus say, and now they're hearing these apostles say that it was never intended to be that way. The love of God was intended to come to us as a free gift. It wasn't supposed to be a heavy burden, but, but thousands are now responding to this. And the, the thousands that are responding, it's, it's causing a little bit of conflict amongst those who are a little slower to believe. But let me, let me tell you kind of what's happening here in Acts chapter 2. There was a, a short little sermon that Peter, Cephas, the one who had said, I'll never desert you, Jesus, and then did kind of pretend he didn't know him. But then Jesus says, I forgive you. Just go lead my sheep, care for my, care for my flock. And he has, and he does, and he preaches a sermon when the Spirit comes. And this is just a, the, sort of the tail end of it. But, but after telling all the ways that Jesus had fulfilled the, the awaited Messiah, trying to say to the Jewish followers, look, we're not asking you to do a new thing. We're just trying to tell you that the Messiah we've all been waiting for has actually arrived. He is here. Wait no longer. He finishes by saying this. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? To which Peter replied, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Thousands were responding, but what were they responding to? Well, in summary, responding to the good news that Jesus is Lord, the Messiah has come. That's good news for folks who have been waiting thousands of years for such a Messiah to arrive. It's great news, in fact. Jesus is Lord, and the kingdom of God has arrived right here amongst you. That's worth responding to. Second, the, the sermon says, repent from your sin. Turn around. Change your mind. Change your purpose. This, this Greek word for repent in some cases, has sort of a military uh, connotation to it where you're, you're marching in one direction and you repent. You about face, I think is what the proper term is, and you turn the other direction. Peter is trying to compel these people. The way you're living right now is headed in the wrong direction. You need to turn around. You need to repent from your sin for the way that you've just lapped up the, the culture around you, become just like it. You need to repent from that and, and turn from it. And then third, if you will do that, you will receive forgiveness, forgiveness for your sins. And in receiving this forgiveness, you will also be filled with the Holy Spirit. These words sound a lot like what we find in Mark, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus' first words, the words written in red. In Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, the Bible tells us that after John was put in prison, John the Baptist... Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, and this is what he said. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Peter says repent, but it wasn't his word. It was Jesus' word. Jesus knew that we would all need to turn in a new direction. Leave the life we've been living and step into a new life that he was giving us. Repent and believe the good news. Change your mind. You know how hard it is to change a mind? It's super hard. It's easier said than done. I mean, once you've been living with your mind fixed on something for so long and someone comes along with a different way of thinking, it's hard to get on board. It's hard to get on board at least Immediately, I mean, something as silly as I was uh, celebrating the life of one of my good friends yesterday. He passed away this past week. Huge Aggie fan. Huge Aggie fan. And if you've been around here, you know I'm not a huge Aggie fan. I, 
I love Aggie people. I do. I love y'all with the just love of God. But I have you know, and I think there's only one picture to prove it. I've asked that it be demolished. I wore an Aggie shirt to that funeral yesterday. Now, I'm not becoming Aggie, let's be clear. But if that man was willing to wear a TCU shirt to cheer my boys on, I'm willing to wear an Aggie shirt to celebrate his life. This whole chapter 15 is gonna call us to that sort of open-mindedness. I mean, when we step into this, this Acts, there's gonna be people who are being asked to have their minds changed. Ultimately, to have their hearts changed, to have their whole purpose changed, to, to take the things that they thought mattered the most and to put them in proper perspective, to start paying attention to what really matters the most. These Jews, to be fair, were being asked to, to take everything they've ever known about God and to call it a little bit into question. I mean, this wasn't... We, we shouldn't look at these Jewish people and go, oh, come on, get on board. No, generation after generation after generation of mama and grandmama and daddy and granddaddy telling them this is the way to God, this is how we understand God, this is how we know God, this is how we follow God. All of a sudden, it's all being challenged. If challenging this Jewish thought ultimately gets Jesus killed, you can only imagine how these apostles are feeling as they walk into new towns to try to convince the townspeople of a new way. And that brings us back into Acts again. You remember that these apostles are preaching this news and chapter eight, a little bit later in Acts, they, uh, Stephen, another apostle, he gets up and he starts preaching, has Peter head done. Things don't go quite as well for him. He ends up getting stoned to death with rocks. The church ultimately gets scattered. But what we'll find is sometimes the scattering can lead to greater growth. I think I heard it said once that um, the, the, the people thought they could scatter the Christians by stomping on them as if it would be like a, like a smothering of our work. But uh, some have said it was almost like stepping on an anthill. You ever stepped on an anthill? <laughs> you haven't killed the ants. You've merely spread them out. Or as has been said by other theologians, they thought they could kill us. They just didn't realize we were seeds. And in this moment in, in Acts, in chapter 8, chapter 9, there's a scattering of the disciples. Saul has his conversion in chapter 9. And then he and other apostles who had followed after Jesus, they all start moving into the, the towns and villages around them. The Jews continue to be a little slow to take in this information, but the Gentiles, the Gentiles, the Greeks, they were wide open ears. What? You mean we can be saved too? We don't have to do all the things those Jews do, but we can just accept Jesus and we'll be saved? Huh? What did I hear you say? Now, if you're Jewish and you've been following all the rules for all these years, all of a sudden you're like, wait a second here. They're getting in way too easy. They should have to go through what we went through. It's almost like going to a, a room full of fraternity brothers and saying, hey, our next pledge class, they get to go through with no hazing, no pledge ship. Pledge ship is over. We're just gonna take in members from here on out. If you're a fraternity guy, you know what that looks like. Or the military were to say, y'all can all come in. No basic training. What? This seems to be kind of what they're doing. These Jewish converts think that the Gentiles should have to become Jewish first. And, and quite honestly, the primary sign of this wasn't something the guys were all that excited about. If you've pre-read chapter 15, we're gonna have the word circumcision being said over and over and over. It's gonna make you male readers a little bit uncomfortable as we read but I'm gonna read it anyway. Chapter 15, verse one through 11. This is the chapter we're on, and here's what's going on. Certain people, don't know who those certain people were, they came down from Judea to Antioch. Remember Antioch, a couple chapters earlier, we were told is where the Christians were first named Christians. So from Judea to Antioch, and they were teaching the believers that unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. 
This brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute and a debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas are on the same team against these others. They were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, I mean, I don't even have to tell you what they said. If you know anything about Pharisees, you know it's going to be wah, wah. Here's another wah, wah. The Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Did you, did you miss the few, few verses just before that? They were all celebrating how the Gentiles were being converted. The, the message of Jesus was being spread. Everybody was super excited until the Pharisees stepped in, the law keepers. They must be circumcised. So the apostles and the elders met to consider this question. And after much discussion, Peter got up and he addressed them. He said, brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He, speaking of God, did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? He says, basically, look, the rules have been hard on us too. Why in the world would we want to put those heavy loaded rules on these others? Isn't the whole goal to get the world saved? Isn't the whole goal to make the love of God known to the people? Why are we making it so difficult? And his last remark here, he says, no, no, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. And then the rest follows. Others stand up and speak, one of them being James, Jesus' half-brother. He speaks up, and I guess when you have the half-brother of Jesus speaking, you start listening a little more carefully. He somehow convinces them collectively that they need to, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we send some representatives back and we'll send a letter, and we'll, we'll let them know that, okay, circumcision isn't going to be necessary. You don't have to go backwards, retroactive, but there is a way of living that will mark you as a follower of Jesus, and lays out some rules around eating what we should eat and not eat, and, and what is sexually moral and what's not sexually moral, and they don't tell us, they don't go into detail on these things, but you would think by this moment that maybe the crisis has been averted. But then we pick up the final part of the chapter. In verse 36, the very last little section, we get sometime later, after this had all been solved, sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. Commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. It's really interesting that if you go back to chapter 13, you're gonna find Luke saying that John Mark had left them, but he doesn't go into detail about why he left them or if he quit on them, which is why Eugene Peterson, who writes the message, if you go and read the message version of this chapter, I think Eugene takes a little bit too much liberty and really cast a, a really tough shadow on John Mark that maybe somehow he deserted. Now, now, Paul seems to suggest this, but we don't really know what John Mark did. We just know that John Mark decided somewhere around Pamphylia to, to head back home to Jerusalem. And now Barnabas, who is the son of encouragement, Barnabas who had let Saul into the fellowship of believers in the very first place back in chapter nine and 10. Now Barnabas is just trying to say to Saul, hey bro, you weren't exactly the cream of the crop either when you stepped into this fellowship. You hadn't exactly done it all right either. In fact, if we just wanna make record of this, John Mark, 
Number of Christians he killed, zero. Number of Christians you killed, well, hard to count. But I do remember that those people who killed Stephen were laying their cloaks at your feet. And now you want to keep John Mark out of this because he left us? You can see the spirit of Barnabas really coming alive again. He's, he's the defender. But an interesting thing happens here. This, in this chapter of controversy, it seems that the good news of God continued to move forward. Amongst the people who were having this sharp argument, group against group, and now even individual against individual. It seems that somehow the good news of God cannot be stopped. It cannot be stopped. God will find his own way to step into the problems that we as humans cause, into our own interpersonal conflicts, and God will make a way. You know, think about this in just a sort of a modern way. You know, you hear us, if you're around our church very often, you hear that every single morning, you not only pray for us, we who gather in this space, but we pray for our friends who are worshiping over in the harvest, in the loft, and in traditional and in Spanish, over Montgomery, and soon in Creekside. And you might think, well, well, of course you'd pray for your own people. They're all Methodist. Some of them just have louder music, darker rooms, more smoke machines. <laughs> just preferences. But if you are here very often, you'll also pick up that we don't stop with only praying for our church and its expressions in different campuses we pray specifically for Greg Johnson and for Restoration Church. If you're unaware, they're a wonderful church. It started about a year before we did, and they're up the road a little further on the right. They just finished a building project, beautiful space they've created. You'll hear us praying for Heath. Heath Ferguson is the pastor at Connect Church over here. It used to be the Wood Forest Church. They were a free will Baptist church. They renamed themselves, and they moved on to the property that they had purchased years before. Heath Ferguson Connect Church. We, we pray for Justin Dancer and Hope Church. They're the Baptist Church. If you have kids that go to Lone Star, as you make your way up to that long, arduous car line, they're the church that's over to the right that some of you park in their parking lot to cheat the system. That, that church. That's Justin. Now, some would say, why are you praying for that Baptist church? Why are you praying for that fellowship model, Woods Edge Church plant? Why would you pray for them? I mean, aren't they different than us? Why do you every now and then even pray for Catholic churches and Pentecostal churches? And Well, because at our core, in the essentials, we are one. We're one. If there was only a Methodist movement, there'd be a whole lot fewer Christians in this world because the Methodists can only do as much as Methodists can do. And if there was only the Baptist church, there'd be a lot fewer Christians in this world. And if there were only Catholics and there were only Presbyterians and there were only Pentecostals and there were only fill in the blank, there'd be a lot fewer Christians, a lot fewer folks who have been rescued by the love of God. Chapter 15 is a great reminder for me that this quote that we can't really even figure out who to attribute it to. Some say Augustine. Some have even said Wesley. I think Methodists think every good word was ever spoken was spoken by Wesley. I think Wesley said a lot of things that had been said before. Maybe just should have given more credit to those voices. But there's this statement, maybe you've heard it in your own tradition before you became a part of ours, that in essentials, unity. Unity around the things that are essential. In the non-essentials, the things that are sort of secondary, like should we baptize infants or only baptize believing adults? It's a non-essential because both can be witnessed in the scriptures. They would say liberty liberty. Let people practice following after Jesus in these non-essential ways by their preferences, by the way they understand the scriptures. And third, in all things, 
essentials and non-essentials? Charity. You see, all of the teachings, if, if you want to go back to what does it take to be saved, that's kind of an essential question. Well, there's lots of answers. When Jesus was asked in the Gospels, how do I inherit the kingdom of God or how is it that I can be saved? You know how he responded on a couple of occasions. On one occasion, he told the parable of the Good Samaritan. You should go to your enemy who is hurting. You should put them up in a hotel and pay for as many nights as they need. You should love your neighbor. In another case, he said to a rich man, you want to be saved? You want to inherit eternal life, the kingdom of God? Go sell everything you own. Give it to the poor and then follow me. But the summation seems to suggest that when Jesus was asked, what's the most important thing about following you? What's the most important way to walk in your steps? Well, his first sermon, as I've already said, repent. Repent. Acknowledge that you haven't figured it out. Acknowledge you can't do it by yourself. Acknowledge you're not good enough and never will be good enough. Acknowledge and repent of all the ways you fall short. There's nothing in there about, look at your neighbor, see all the ways they're falling short. Look at the other churches, see all the things they're doing wrong. Look at that preacher and examine his life. No, it wasn't there. He said, repent. It was first thing, repent. I'm of the mind that if, if we just focused on our own need for repentance and our own sin, we wouldn't have time to worry about anybody else. But then he says, love God with every part of you, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he said, there's another one just like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It, it, it seems that all of the disagreements that we read about in chapter 15 quite possibly could have been averted. If we let essentials be essentials, not essentials be non essentials, but in all things, love. Love. Remember that you have been welcomed into this family not by your own work not by your own cleaning yourself up, not by your own being good enough, not by your own having more things in the positive column than the negative column. You are in the family of God for one reason. That's the reason that the thief on the cross would have given. The guy on the middle cross, he said, I could come. No other way. I know for me and maybe for you, this would be a really wonderful time to stop and just repent. Repent and believe the good news of the gospel that God loved us so much that he came to us, that he found us, that he healed us, that he forgave us, that he invited us into the family of God because he wanted to. That's what I want us to pray about as we close. God, I am so, so grateful that before I even knew I needed a Savior, you knew I would need a Savior. I'm so grateful that throughout my life of almost 50 years of trying to get it right, and more frequently getting it wrong. That you don't determine my worthiness to be in your family by how well I'm doing. But you invited me into your family when I was willing to get on my knees and to just say, God, I cannot do this anymore by myself. I cannot be good enough to step into the holy presence of my holy God. I cannot. 
Thank you, God, that somewhere along the way you, you opened my eyes to that truth. God, this morning I repent of all the ways, of all the ways I've tried to believe that my way of following you is better than someone else's way of following you. I repent of all the ways that I've not loved, that I've not listened. I repent of all the ways uh, that I've decided I could be the judge and the jury on your behalf. God, I repent of my sin. And I ask that you would do for me as you've done countless times before, that you would forgive me. That you would wipe clean parts of my life that have not been pleasing in your eyes. I receive again, God, your free gift of salvation into my life. I receive again, as I have countless times, your forgiveness. I receive again your Holy Spirit into my life. Asking that you would allow him to comfort me and to guide me, to direct me. And I pray you'd do that not only for me, but for my brothers and sisters in the room who want nothing more than for you to be known in this community. Teach us and guide us and take us. In Jesus' name, amen.